when I first came here, this house was very different in that it had a claustrophobic feeling because I think what they had done with this house is they had attempted to turn it into a museum. So they had sheetrocked all the exterior walls that lead into the courtyard, and they had sheetrocked, the which, which was the dining room. So the house was kind of encumbered with floor to ceiling walls. That may have made it better as a museum for showing work, but they kind of um, did away with the essence of the house. And I thought that this was a beautiful, modernist, mid-century house. And what I thought ought to be done was that the transparency of the house needed to be restored. By that I mean you have a situation where you have an internal courtyard that has windows facing the interior. So there's a possibility from looking outside through one um, facade of glass past the hallway through another facade of glass into what was a room which had a grand piano. So I thought it would be incumbent on me to deal with my work in relationship to the original house, not in relationship to um, the altered house. So I wanted to reveal what the original house was not, not for two reasons. One, I thought the architecture would make sense and why not see the house in all its glory. Two, I was interested to see the light. And if you're going to show drawings, you better have some light. Otherwise, the drawings don't really um, bespeak of uh, the quality they could have. So having said that, I had to reduce the number of works I could possibly put in the show because I'm giving up a lot of footage of wall space. But if I thought about it, the wall space I'm actually giving up is hallway space anyway, and it's hallway space that turns inward. And then there was one room of wall space where I thought I, I, if I'd put drawings on four rooms in that wall, it would have been too cramped anyway. And as it is, we're using three of those walls. So the show may suffer in that I'm not putting in as much work as I could possibly have, but I think the interplay between the house, the transparency of the house, the originality of the house, and the drawings in the house makes sense. Also, I think the drawings in, in the internal rooms make sense. So. It's a small scale show, but I think it has a certain um, interior sensitivity to it. I didn't want to do a big Baroque show and I didn't want to do a big intervention here. I didn't think this house required that. that were done um, on the floor where I would pay, pour paint stick on, on a large piece of paper. And then I put screening, like window screening, on top of the uh, wet paint stick. And then either with my hand or with my foot, I would um, make a path that would eventually, from the inside out, which would eventually form a kind of a rough circle. Then I would take a small uh, template 
to kind of catch it right at the end, to kind of form an, an irregular circle. And two of those smaller drawings are in the hallway. They date probably, they're probably 20 years old. And then there's some larger uh, rounds called out of rounds. They're probably about 80 inches, 70 inches square. One of them is in the dining room. Uh, I think that's the biggest. And um, those drawings are very, very compacted. And um, they're very much about materiality. And when I was a student, uh, I studied at Yale. There was one thing that was very important in my development that I never forgot, is that matter, material itself, informs form. So if you're going to use matter, uh, depending how you use it, you can um, investigate it so that it actually allows you to understand what its structural possibilities are. Now you can say, well, what does that exactly mean? One of the things that was interesting when I studied at Yale is that they would say, take any shape and make it in concrete, then make it in glass, then make it in plastic, then make it in clay. And you can see that just the shape isn't what predominates, it's the matter of the matter, it's the material of the matter. difficult about sculpture is the experiment takes place at a very small scale and that's usually an inch to a foot and then it's translated into a larger scale so if I'm building models in lead at a one to foot inch scale the, the models can be 40 inches high but that means they're going to be 40 feet long that's a very different idea about uh, continuous experimentation than when you're dealing with drawing where you're getting an immediate feedback and there's no delay between the completion of the work and your investigation with it. So it's a continual process. Where sculpture is always a protracted process because it goes from model to computer to fabricator, back to the computer, back to the fabricator. Fabricator makes a model, sends it back to me. We adjust the model, goes back to the fabricator. So with sculpture, you could be backlogged with one work three years or even longer. So you have to have a lot of, with sculpture, you have to have a lot of pots on the, on the fire because you never know which one is going to come to fruition. It's not, it's not like drawing. You don't get an immediate feedback with drawing. So drawing, because you get an immediate feedback, you can follow the notions of where it is the drawing's taking you. So in a sense, the drawings have the possibility, even though you re may repeat the process, of opening an idea within the process itself, where if the situation is delayed, that form of investigation is impossible. And I think that's true of, of most people I can think of, whether they're sculptors or painters, is if you look at their drawings, it's probably the best index to how they think. It's probably the most subjective thing you can think. It's, it's the, the closest thing to their handwriting. It's the closest thing to thought, actually. I was dealing with um, a transparent piece of plastic. It's called mylar. What I was, the way I was doing it is I was um, putting a piece of mylar face down on some black litho crayon. So I can't see what I'm doing. I just inscribe on, on the mylar. And the mylar is covered with um, black. 
So I inscribe on the mylar on, on this side, and you turn it over and you have a drawing. And then after a point, I thought, that, that's interesting, but I'm not using the transparency of the mylar. So then what I did is I took one piece of mylar and I covered it black. And I took another piece of mylar and I covered it black. So you have two pieces of black mylar. Then I took a clear piece of black of mylar, clear, no, no, nothing on it. And like a sandwich, I put the clear piece between the two other pieces. Now, if you have a clear piece of mylar between two pieces of mylar that have black here and black here, now what you're looking at is just a black piece of mylar because you're looking through the transparency, right? And below, there's a clear piece of mylar, and below that, there's another black piece, right? When you inscribe with a tool on the top of the mylar, it transfers the pigment, the lithocrayon, to the mylar that's the clear sheet, both on the front and the back. So now you have a drawing, when you pull the two pieces of the sandwich apart, you have a drawing that's on both the front of the mylar and the back of the mylar. So when you look at the drawing, you can see that some of the lithocrayon has actually picked itself up on the front of the mylar. It can almost touch it. And then when you look through the mylar, you can see that some of it looks um, dull. And that's because it's behind the mylar. So it's coming through the mylar. So in a sense, when you look at the transparencies, you're looking at a drawing that is on both sides of the piece of mylar. And you have to understand that that was done when I was unable to see either the front or the back because what I'm doing is drawing on the top of the, the mylar. So I really can't see what's going on until I pull both pieces apart. I think, I, think with, I think with drawing, the biggest problem with drawing, it, it's the problematic of drawing, is a figure ground problem. So if you draw with a line on a piece of paper, you have a figure on the ground. So the paper is always, like people would say, oh, the background, or you have to fill in the paper, or whatever. And I think since the history of time, the problematic of drawing has been, how do you make both the paper and the marking on the paper reveal itself as being both positive and negative. Now, some people have been very good at it. If you take um, Van Gogh, who I don't particularly care for his paintings, but if you look at his drawings, the marking on his drawings is absolutely amazing. He invented different kinds of marks to actually fill the page to make the white of the paper as sparkle as the black. Or if you take drawings by Seurat, he was able to pass the crayon over the tooth of the drawing to pick up the gray scale from white to black within the surface of the entire drawing. That problem of figure ground has, has always interested me. If we come to the last room, where you have um, what's called the reversals, it's a very simple problem. How do you, again, deal with the figure ground problem? There's one piece of paper on the top, another piece of paper on the bottom. If you divide the paper randomly between top and bottom, not, not in half, let's say two-thirds. Okay, black here, white here. Now, if you reverse that on the bottom, you have white here, black here. If you do it exactly the same size, you have black, white, white, black. All those drawings are, are reversals. It's simply that what's on top, black, white, or white, black, is exactly the difference in, proportionally to what's on the bottom. So the two pieces of paper reverse themselves. It's a very simple idea and you would have thought that in the history of drawing or in the history of painting that idea would have already been revealed or exposed, just that no one did it. When, when I first did it I was actually amazed that no one had thought about the problematic of having done that because it seems like such a self-evident thing to do, to make the white positive. Notebook drawings, that's something I do all the time. I, I do it practically every day. And it's a way of keeping my hand and my eye um, in tune. I think the eye is a muscle, and the more you practice, the, the better you see. And, and I've always done this. I've done it since I was four or five years old. So it's a way of grasping the world or keeping engaged with the world. I don't take the notebook drawings um, as finished works. I never sell the notebook drawings. Um, I'll probably give them to a university or whatever. And the first time I ever showed them was at the Metropolitan Museum. 
Then um, I showed him San Francisco and uh, Fort Worth because that tra show traveled. And this is just the fourth time I've shown them. Uh, I'm showing a little different selection here because two of them went to San Francisco. But they're just a way of, I think, informing people about what this person does in his daily life. Not making finished works, but how does this person keep a collective diary of what he sees or what he's about to see or where he's been. So there are drawings from Peru, there are drawings from Qatar, there are drawings from France, there are drawings from just different places I've been and different things that there are notations of sculptures that were under process, there are notations of sculptures that were being made. Um, there are a few, most of the drawings are done before the sculptures are actually completed, thinking about what I'm going to make. There, I don't usually draw after my work's complete. I don't go and then go back and draw from the sculptures. I don't depict or illustrate my sculptures. Beforehand, I make notations for myself to think about what, what it is I might or might not make. But I don't take them as being consequential. I think the notebook drawings are diaristic and they're like diary drawings and they're like sketchbooks, but they're not, they're not for public consumption. Yeah, I think, that, I think if we take the transparencies or the reversals or the riff drawings, if you, if you think of those, those are an autonomous body of work that deals with the problematic of the history of drawing and how do you um, deal with the history of drawing and try to make a contribution to what you think that language is, because drawing is a language. I mean, I think how you draw tells about how you see and how you see is to a great deal how you think. And I think there's always been the problematic of drawing, and that, that interests me. And so I have an autonomous body of work that's totally separate from my sculpture that deals with that problem. Actually, there's a show that I just saw two days ago, uh, Lydia Clark. Mm -hmm. the, the most interesting thing, it's at, it's at the yeah, modern yeah, right I now. Just... I thought one of the most interesting things about it was that she had these little matchboxes. Mm -hmm. Do you know those works? Yeah, Where yeah, she took yeah, matchboxes, yeah, yeah. put tape around them. But by it. putting tape around the, the boxes, the matchboxes, she was able to make discrete volumes within the matchboxes. Then she was able to take the matchboxes and use them as modules to construct forms that mimicked architecture to a degree. In fact, I thought it was one of the most interesting things, one of the most intense things in the entire show, those simple little matchboxes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why they're interesting, because I think that they are an indication to how she thinks. Just the way you can see in those matchboxes, how, how her thought is developing. I think more clearly you can see it there than you can even see in the hinge pieces that unfold because those are very hard to reconstruct. But with the matchboxes, you can actually see how she's taken one, added it to another, inverted it, um, accumulated it, and made form. I think, I think it's very difficult to deal with nature as an artifice and bring it together within a construct to make um, something that's biological an artifice for art. Um, the Japanese did it in the Zen gardens. Bula Marx did it in Brazil by going into the jungle, bringing out species that had never been named before. It's actually quite remarkable. If you look at the planting here, there are some trees that I was just sitting out on the porch here where the trees are just hanging down in a way that they, they take your breath away. So I think this person, if you're talking about drawing in space, used nature to redraw space. And what's interesting about it is it's a total artifice, not real. It doesn't grow in nature the way he constructed it. So he used plant life to construct entire environments and then he figured out how to do inlay on the street and on the ground and how to form passages in the inlay to actually do kind of urban development. And if you look at the city and the layout of the city and the way, if particularly you go around the lagoon, you go along the ocean, it's not in what I would call the, um, 
striated parts of town. It's more in the smooth sections of town. If you think of the striated parts of the city, it's more like the favelas coming down into the um, collage of the city. Where he is really important, I think, is how to develop the smooth passages of this city. And he's done it simply through drawing and planting and curvilinear kinds of um, shapings. So if you look at most of what he's done, it has a serpentine kind of um, relation to the environment. But it's no different than this city because this city is very sinuous. This city's not laid out like a grid. And I think it comes because of the, the way the, the um, crevices come between the mountains. And I think it's because of the way the shoreline bends. So it's very natural for someone to come here and deal with curvilinear shape.